so um, right page problem system is uh, this talk as, as I said in the beginning um, in the stand up I'm uh, I'm a father since a week now uh, so a little bit under the weather <coughs> to some extent uh, this will show in this presentation and it's a bit uh, over the, all over the place but I think I can give some interesting insights um, to the agenda um, because I didn't know quite well who is sitting here in your audience, I also inserted in what is e-commerce fraud from our view, right face view, um, and then go more into the details of what I'm actually trying to get at. Uh, first, a bit about myself um, and right Um My background is in economics and statistics. Uh, I have a passion for coffee, notebooks, and so paper notebooks and pens. Uh, and methods for decision making, especially on uncertainty. Um, uh, this uh, third one I just said. Um, I joined GradePay three years ago as a risk analyst after my studies. Um, GradePay, for you that don't know it, is a like, medium sized company in Berlin, uh, now almost 10 years old, uh, roughly 450 people. We offer white label uh, deferred payment solutions, so open invoice, direct debit, and installment plans. And Payment just to have it, it's, uh, but it's actually a low risky business. Um, uh, as a size, roughly 2 billion in, in revenue last year, and we are now part of the next group, which is quite uh, big. We first joined with uh, Frank Cardiff, and now next is this thing in, um, uh, in the credit card business company. Uh, and now I'm responsible for the ML based fraud prevention system and the business intelligence function. e-commerce fraud. Um, it's mostly uh, what we deal with identity theft, and that's uh, in uh, roughly four easy steps. You get, uh, as, as you know, you get an identity uh, from somewhere, it can be um, fished or from a telephone book, um, it doesn't really matter, and especially for open invoice, you don't need very much. That's why people in German-speaking countries like it, because you don't need to provide lots of data, um, but what's in, it makes it very easy to fraud there. So name, address, birthday from someone, uh, preferably with, uh, with a good credit score. So uh, we saw some patterns with um, rich Munich areas that had very high fraud rates, and you wonder, or very high default rates, and you wonder why. Um, that's the case why they they just have good credit scores and they get approved by the German credit bureaus when we ask them. Then you try to order some goods and get them delivered to an uh, address that you provide. So you put the billing address of the person you, are, you just stole their identity from and uh, you deliver it to some uh, address that suits you or you intercept it uh, on the way um, to that person. Uh, and you hope when you, as soon as you check out, you hope that the transaction goes through. Uh, if it goes through, you intercept and uh, resell the goods or whatever. Uh, and if it's not successful, you try again. Uh, and you try with different input values. And this, this last step, if you fail, you try again, is the interesting part that makes it um, so interesting for my job. Um, Yes, uh, we see a very broad spectrum of uh, our fraud clientele, so um, let's say they're the anti user of our, our platform. There's friendly fraud where um, people order on behalf of friends or someone else uh, without knowledge. Uh, some like small time bandits that try it once in a while, and it, these patterns they are quite obvious. It's um, like our learning material for new uh, fraud screeners that uh, they, they look uh, over that. But the very serious business is then with highly organized crime where we see uh, real compa like companies, organizations that pop up have very elaborate structures uh, to yeah, do their fraud business and with a real business case and very sophisticated methods. They have different departments, they have people that design phishing emails to get data, to get identity information. They have um, delivery teams or uh, intercept teams or um, people that hire other people uh, to be 
like a mule to harvest lots of packages and then the, the address gets blocked uh, then after some time. So the prop behavior, we, um, we see therefore constantly changing user behavior. So we see it as the user behavior, but uh, certainly it's not maybe one frauded user is, looks like the same user, but it's a different person behind it. And every time uh, maybe this kind of fraud company. Uh, is, uh, it's a cat and mouse game in the sense that uh, we improve our system and they improve their system and uh, we see that uh, quite um, quite well that once we have a new prevention or a new intervention in place it takes between a, a couple of hours or days until a few weeks until they recognize that pattern doesn't work anymore they spread out and really try and error new things and then they focus on a new new loophole so maybe uh, in terms of agile product development we can learn from talks um, uh, yes um, and maybe from the previous talk what I um, in my aha moment at, at Rayplay was when I recognized that the order I see is not necessarily uh, any true information or I uh, must assume that nothing is wrong, uh, nothing is correct in this order. Every, everything is fake or um, not intended as I think it is. So this uh, kind of um, pessimistic view about uh, user behavior and um, let's say uh, assuming that I don't know anything really helped me to devise systems that uh, generate knowledge for us and once we have knowledge we can counteract a certain behavior. So this is um, complex interactions. Uh, the interesting part um, where I started as a risk analyst uh, analyzing fraud patterns. Uh, and you find something, you uh, see that if you would block certain parts of the order, certain um, parameters, anything, you would uh, prevent this pattern and then you want to know or uh, the business side, the commercial side wants to know what's the impact if we deploy such a intervention. Uh, then I would do an analysis and say okay we catch so many fraudsters uh, and on the other hand we uh, reject so many good customers uh, as false positives. Um, so what's the trade-off there? Uh, I'm just the analyst, I give you the odds and you to decide. But uh, the problem here is evaluating on past data. So what we did back then was uh, looking at, so having the rules, applying it to, let's say, past month of data, saying, well, it would have prevented so much. But since we are dealing with humans and uh, not uh, machines or in a very um, uh, easy systems, uh, as soon as you deploy a rule, they change their behavior. And uh, then your analysis goes out of the window and you need to, uh, you don't know anything and maybe your KPIs that you observe go up or down and improve or uh, go totally unexpected ways just because they do weird things. And not only the fraudsters do weird things, but also the normal users because their usual way of ordering things get, gets blocked uh, in some sense. So uh, this is then my, and I'm, I'm, I'm quite fast, we have lots of time for Q&A uh, later. Um, so how does machine learning fit into this and how to deal with this complexity there? Uh, first of all, uh, why did we, or what did ML machine learning do for us? Um, we use it for automated pattern detection. Uh, so it's actually not better than our fraud screeners at the moment, our, our systems. It's just faster and can operate on more data uh, than a human, uh, which is nice, but our fraud screeners are still, still better at detecting or finding new patterns. Uh, it does, however, detect patterns that we didn't know before uh, for uh, some minor parts. 
and uh, in terms of real-time decision making, it allows us to have a much more uh, complex or complicated decision function, uh, and you don't need any software engineer or um, analyst writing if-then rules uh, that are pages long to have a certain outcome in the end. You have your model and that does it for you. And it allows us to, to um, update our system much faster than monitoring and maintaining handcrafted rules. If you start, um, and it's, there are lots of great tools out there to um, uh, manage rules, but if you have 200 or 500 rules and you need to observe each uh, single uh, one's performance and how they interact, it becomes very complicated and you want to automate it and suddenly you uh, have the machine on your code. Um, so, uh, how did we start with machine learning? Um, we started out of necessity. We had a case where we had no other or real proper other option for uh, risk management um, in place for a new launch. And there we decided, okay, this is a great place to actually try something where we don't know if it pays off or not. Because uh, at worst, it's uh, as bad as we expect it to be, and at best, we prevent some uh, bad behavior. So we had um, a very strong focus on getting something for, for this um, new market ready that is just good enough and where we have no knowledge on uh, how good it will be or might be, we just need to make, uh, shoot into the blue and, and see what stays. And, uh, this, in hindsight, uh, it um, was quite fast and we uh, just Three people, um, a scientist, myself, and a software engineer, uh, developed a system that uh, was then in production after three months. When I uh, talk to some other companies, for them it's, it takes a bit longer to get machine learning in, in a production setting. Um, this is just hinting at my uh, takeaways at the end. One of the key things, uh, cross-functional teams and trial and error, uh, is really key here. Or it's my experience at least. Uh, and what's, what made it possible was the freedom and trust from our leadership team uh, that we can just do it and fail and waste resources, uh, but maybe something good comes out of it. Uh, so the, the second stage was um, to, uh, we had this proof of concept and we now said, okay, this works here barely but how can we adapt this to a more useful case and start generating some value? And um, once we uh, went live with this approach and, it start, and we saw that it saved us huge amounts of money, it's uh, a good basis of argumentation to say, okay, now we can invest into other things just because we have something in place that is generating value like, passively for us. We, we have developed something, it runs automatically, uh, it's generating value and we can start um, making some improvements on top of it. And this is then the third stage that we are currently in. Um, is we scratch everything, we uh, took everything away and built it from, from scratch, um, which uh, had a three month experimentation period before that, uh, which I needed to argue with my boss to let me put through that and have a um, team not working on anything productive in that uh, case. Uh, but it gave the team the opportunity to fix some known issues and like unmet desires, where in the first uh, or in the, this second stage we saw uh, or we learned what was missing, what we need to do better and where we need to improve. And here we uh, could tackle these problems and set it up more properly. Uh, also, it's interesting here that uh, this was the first time that we had uh, one team, uh, a joint team working on it. Before it was a data science team and a software engineering team working separately, as separate scrum teams with separate backlogs and priorities, which was very conflicting. And now we had a, uh, or we have a cross-functional team that has one backlog, is just working on that, and they can do everything from research to uh, DevOps. Uh, all in a single 
other team. Yeah. There are other challenges because the team has now uh, 11 people in it, uh, which is a big much, uh, a, a big much for Scrum. But uh, it, it actually was at the moment quite wrong. Uh, yes, in this uh, experimentation period, we tried different technologies and programming languages. Uh, we built prototypes in different languages and technologies uh, and set up a new architecture which made it more adjustable for the future. Uh, so, concluding this section, uh, I think um, machine learning is, is hyped uh, as a thing itself. It's just another tool, and especially I think over time it will grow more and more into the software engineering domain and there will be uh, more roles required to develop certain products um, because you uh, now you have maybe software engineers and uh, test engineers or QA engineers um, maybe a data engineer but uh, if you want to start with machine learning you need someone that knows statistics and mathematics that as commonly now referred to the data scientists, um, machine learning engineers as people that are sort of in between the data scientists and the software engineer, very unclear definitions, uh, so you can interpret them as you like and see fit, that's uh, totally fine. Um, and, and data engineers for the data pipelines because suddenly you don't have uh, software that runs somewhere, but you have a database that needs to be updated, you need to have high quality data streams uh, everywhere and you need to have very good monitoring for your uh, system because machine learning in the end allows you to make more complex decisions in an automated fashion and especially some decisions where you didn't or didn't need to think of the way how the decision is made beforehand you just specify this is one where I want to get it and this is the margin of error I'm comfortable with and then machine please do the work uh, and, and for that there I think um, uh, there are then other risks because if you screw that up it uh, screws up on a larger scale um, but uh, um, in the end it's again software development or uh, and product development for me and why I think the team is here uh, more important than, than the tools is uh, the approach to that, uh, which is, um, or what we did was very experimental, uh, try and error, basically with no proper backlog or anything, it was just saying, okay, we, we actually have some people that did science stuff before, uh, before they joined us, so uh, they knew what a good scientific approach is and the, this and Scrum or Agile works really well together if you um, take it seriously that you do an experiment and then be open-minded on what comes at the end uh, and you need to phrase proper hypotheses at the beginning and uh, say okay I decide in this direction or in that direction to, to go further if certain assumptions and hypotheses are met or not. And uh, yeah, so this is what I learned from my team. And, uh, I think is um, in this area where you have a complex problem to solve uh, and uh, yet not super clear on the uh, tool uh, in place that you just need to be um, very pragmatic and constructive to uh, go in, in small easy steps. This takes me to my takeaways. Um, so under the assumption that uh, you are in a high uncertainty uh, area with hard to get information, um, which for, for Rayquel this fraud case um, is, because we just provide payment methods. We don't have any checkout information except the basket, so we don't have uh, the path or anything. We just see the order itself, and from that we need to make up the pattern. Uh, so all we uh, want to do is gather more and more information to reduce this uncertainty and then make a decision. Uh, so what is important in my view for uh, developing such a system uh, and for fraud in a specific case or I think for, for anything that is um, in this uh, field of uncertainty and complexity is a deliberate trial and error um, tactic. 
uh, deliberate in the sense that you are consciously trying different things and uh, uh, exploring the map of possibilities. Um, that means also doing lots of experiments uh, and testing a change or decision um, under contrary scenarios or assumptions. Uh, it means you look at everything from a different angle and you see uh, where your argumentation or your logic falls down because um, maybe uh, you don't have the very clear KPIs that can, that can measure that. Change in small doses because uh, from that comes a bit from my statistics background. Uh, you also just want to do one change at a time to see the, its impact. Um, if you can do uh, some sort of like A/B testing or um, proper uh, field experiments, that's very nice. Uh, and these change in small doses or small steps forward makes it easier to and course correct. And, uh, we could have said we develop uh, a machine learning system very complicated, very uh, intricate uh, within a year and then go live at the end and it wouldn't solve any um, of our problems probably. So um, really where use case specific or try to solve actual problems um, first and then see where we can uh, optimize from there. Uh, as I said this requires close monitoring of product performance and uh, means you need to know uh, when is your product performing well or under how do you know that the product is performing well and if you don't know that you don't really know what to monitor for um, and you also don't really know where, what to aim for. Uh, interestingly if you talk with um, or when I talked to, to a team member uh, who, who is a mathematician and I explained to him that, okay, under which conditions do we know that our product is working well? We defined these conditions and he said, well, if, you, if we know that, we can automate this part as well and auto optimize for better product performance on top of what we already have. So uh, together with people that understand how to uh, automate things and to uh, abstract things, you can from from this view uh, scale quite quite a bit, which so I really like. But maybe it's also weird for other people to to move the human out everywhere. Um, the last part is, and that's uh, again referring to the hype of um, machine learning, uh, the complexity of the tools and uh, of your. Yeah, technologies must fit to the complexity of the problem that you want to solve. Otherwise, uh, it's a waste of time. Uh, and one side, or uh, that also means don't be shy to use complex tools if if you have a complex problem to solve. So we started out with um, linear uh, regressions. Uh, if you know a bit of statistics, that's like the easiest statistical model you can have with the most assumptions. Um, and actually, uh, it turned out pretty bad because bugs just don't behave in a normal way. That's, that's uh, how we saw it. Yeah, thank you. Hi, uh, thanks for the presentation. I was wondering about um, plot patterns. When you would say there is a very simple plot pattern, and you would start with machine learning, which machine learning models have you tried and which? perform better and how did you train your uh, models? Um, so from the training, we, uh, as, uh, as I said, we have our fraud skills. It's like a manual review and they are our expert opinion. Um, and uh, almost the, the first to know when something goes, goes bad. And they give us labels or we give them a certain set of transactions and say, please label them for us because we are not sure what this means. May I follow up? What kind of labels, for example, would you use for basic fraud protection? Uh, labels in the sense that uh, they see it as fraudulent or non-fraudulent. So, yes, no. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Uh, sadly, we don't have the opportunity to stop a transaction because we are just a payment provider. We do not control logistics. Mm -hmm. So we can't say, or we can recommend, please shop. Uh, I would recommend uh, stopping the shipment here. 
uh, but the shop then can say, well, I don't care because red tape pays for it. Uh, I'm out of risk. Uh, that's what red tape is for. Um, so we need to make our real-time system as good as it gets because in the end, afterwards, it's, it's not really possible anymore. And which um, models have you tried out? Yes. How um, they perform? Um, so we, in terms of model types, we haven't tried so much. Uh, we, as I said, started with a logistic regression, so a linear model, um, and then uh, moved uh, to random forest and um, tree-based models, so fairly boosted machines, which currently perform for us the best. The gradient one? Uh, yes. Uh, and maybe uh, on the, because if we talk about machine learning, then it also goes quite quickly to deep learning, and uh, we experimented a bit, but said, okay, this is quite complicated to fine-tune, and we don't want to spend so much time here, we rather want to build this platform uh, at the moment, so we haven't tried experimenting with that. Um, also, we are a bit scared of the explainability problem, because uh, such a um, deep learning model, do, you can't really explain easily how it came to such a prediction. With our tree-based models, in the worst case, we could print out the trees, the decision trees, and could show that to regulators or um, other authorities. Uh, and this gives a certain level of explainability. Um, with neural networks, it's a bit more complicated. And this is just was the trade-off we made in saying, we don't want to invest into this network now, but um, probably experiment on that later. Uh, were you maybe successful in detecting like, complex thought patterns, or is it always something that um, straightforward, like for example, you know that the credit card data is stolen, and um, so, what I um, hear from our fraud screeners is they um, uh, they see that we at least fish away everything that's super easy mm -hmm. with the models. Uh, but also uh, on the other side, uh, somewhere where you can't find a clear cut rule or uh, your the rule you would like to um, so so you see fraud but you can't describe the pattern properly. That's also where we saw that the models work quite well. Uh, these are, so si since we don't have credit card, we, it's open, open invoice and direct debit, it's, it's a bit different. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yes, but uh, I think it's, it's a mix, um, but mostly on the end of the easy stuff. So you said that you sort of abandon deep learning or you're not following deep learning because of the ex explainability problem. But does it happen right now or very often that you have to explain why your model made it such decision or not? Or it's more for, for your sake? Um, I think first it's for our own sake uh, and we need to explain internally uh, because we have um, everyone that uh, orders um, over our payment methods they, if they get rejected, they can call us and then... Um, you need to know why. <laughs> we need to know why, at least our customer service, they need to put it into context. Was this now a, a correct rejection or how should we handle this? And at least internally explaining what the model did uh, mm -hmm. is, is, I think, an important step. Um, yes, you can, you can go ahead. I'm very interested in this part because... Um, so. Do you do something like dark ones before you actually put the model to production, before it actually then has results if the user is fraudulent or not, or something like this, before actually uh, um, then the service can be contacted and asked why you, you do these tests? And probably uh, it's good practice, and I trust you with good practice. But my question is actually connected to the biases mm -hmm. in the models. Mm -hmm. Have you seen cases like this? Uh, um, yes, so, so we don't really have these mm, very like, popular biases. Um, we generally, so uh, this, I, I come back to my point that I assume every data point I get is 
uh, incorrect or fake data. Mm -hmm. uh, and we certainly have a field, for example, uh, um, a gender field or salutation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And some shops put there some default value, others don't. Uh, some have three options, others have only two options. And how should we deal with that? We don't know. We, we see we just uh, see it as some signal where we uh, try to see if we don't interpret the signal itself. We don't say if it's uh, male or female or um, unknown or something else. We don't care. We just see what correlates with fraud and then what statistically makes more sense that uh, this we go in, in which direction we should go. Um, other biases that are more of a problem are things like uh, technical issues where I don't know, we or the shop uh, had a technical issue and the transaction was stopped and uh, a genuine customer tries to order again and again and again and something doesn't work and then our system picks it up and says, oh, there's someone trying to try to order something again and again and again uh, and doesn't come through, so maybe we should start rejecting that person as well and we see that our system kicks in, so these um, this fraud patterns that we see, they are sometimes replicated by normal users and then they get caught uh, in, in this problem. Actually, I was aiming at that. that yeah. That's the interesting part of this. Yeah. yeah. Um, maybe a, a, another example, um, we were contacted by a person that uh, we withdrew um, for like, uh, several transactions money from their bank account because we thought this was a legitimate direct debit transaction. And then we looked into it and we saw that our system uh, let these like five or six um, transactions through and prevented the other hundred, yes. which we couldn't tell now the, the person that might be lucky that we didn't charge you with like several thousands of euros, uh, but only this, this small amount. Um, so uh, yeah. In terms of biases, I, I would say uh, we uh, aim for uh, rather we make the loss than uh, good customers have a bad experience. This was um, it's always uh, this uh, this trade-off of uh, false negative and false positive. So, um, false negative for us is that uh, we thought it's a good one, and it then turned out to be fraudulent. And we rather take on these ones. Uh, and reduce the amount of false positives as much as we can just to avoid this bad experience. Before before you jumped into into the machine learning, <laughs> you had like your your own crafted business rules, stuff, right? Yeah. And uh, you saw that uh, once you come up with the rules, the fraudsters know them, try try an error and, and then circumvent them, right? Uh, the question is, uh, like, how long was that was that cycle? So, uh, if you if you see, if they if they met, if they saw that a given rule is not not coming through, how how long it was it? Days, hours, minutes before they they come up with a changed pattern to circumvent your, your rules? Uh, so that they see that their pattern isn't working. Um, for some areas, it was within hours. And um, uh, sometimes also within two weeks or so. And and right, and uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> right now, how often do you do you update your your, your model? Do you, do you know? Um, depending on the performance, so we uh, monitor its performance, and if it goes, uh, if it starts to deteriorate, we we um, update the models. Okay, okay, thank you. It depends on on the behavior. Yeah, but, but so, so how do you, because you, if you do not spot the fraudulent transaction, you get to know that the given transaction was fraudulent because you did a report, right? Or uh, I would well, imagine that it was. Yeah, so I, 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 I'm not sure how much you can say, uh, but uh, I, I would guess that this, mm -hmm. this works this way. That either you, you spot, uh, uh, I don't know, this case of 100 transactions that should block, and yeah. you, you, you notice that, okay, so we let few of them through, but if there are single transactions, you will know after after your, your merchant or whoever says to you that, hey, 
you let this one through and this was for you, right? The interesting part is the merchants don't really know that this is fraud because after uh, the checkout, it's uh, from a financial side, it's not in their hand anymore. They hand it over to us and we take the risk. So we see if um, we see if the person doesn't pay or if the direct debit bounces on the bank account. And so. Yeah. So, no, I'm just wondering how, how, how long is this 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 loop of, of, of updating the yeah. updating the, the models of like if you if you spot that something is is wrong, is wrong, so how long would it take to you to, to update the model yeah. and, and start detecting? In a good case, uh, a day, and in, in, in bad cases, um, one or two months. Okay, understood. And similar, similar to you guys in, in Zalando, because uh, I believe that, that I, I correct me if I'm wrong, but it's, you, you're working on something similar, like the machine learning to, to, to recognize fraud patterns. So what's exactly the question? Uh, so so is, is it similar to you? So once you detect some fraudulent pattern, you, like how, how how long does it take for you to update the model? There's two factors. One is how long does it take you to detect the pattern, and I think that depends, as you say, on the payment. But for mm -hmm. for example, you would, if you don't have many instruments labeling it, it takes quite a while for you to observe that there are too many people. If you have students, then you can see how stupid the SDA is, right? And then once you observe that something is wrong, if your model deteriorates, then um, the question is how quickly can you retrain? And then you can just retrain the model for these, you can do really quickly. The problem is you don't really have any new data to retrain. Only by observing for three days that something's fishy, okay. then you need that we have enough data uh, uh, so that the retrain model would be very different from the old one. Yeah. So I guess that's mm -hmm. what it is. Yeah, that's why uh, we also didn't go away from business rules. We just don't use them for everything. Um, so it's like the models are the large scale uh, protection, and the business rules then do some finer grained things that work on the um, edge cases. I, I really like the, the, the part. Uh, of your presentation when you talk about the hype of AI. That's not something I hear often. I think it's very odd. And so that's, that's amazing for me that I saw that in your presentation. Because people like, uh, currently ML is the hot buzzword, like blockchain was a couple, maybe a year ago. And so it solves all the problems ever. Um, so um, how do you choose what is the ML? You said it's a complexity thing, but how do you choose, like on, on the, let's say on an example or something, how do you choose what is an ML-based solution and what is actually a rules-based solution? And do you, let, let, let's say, use the rules to test out the ML hypothesis? Mm -hmm. How do you do that? Um, yeah, I'm not sure if I got the question right, but um, so I, we make a trade-off, uh, or we, we try to make a trade-off when we uh, pick a solution in a sense, uh, there are certain assumptions that you need to make for machine learning, for example, having good data and for this classification, if this, this is fraud or non fraud or some other form of classification, uh, you need to have labels, which is much more important, uh, and there one need to one need to invest in. And if this is like cheap or easy to get, uh, and the problem you try to solve, or you, you can't really come up with um, how to formulate a solution, then I would say machine learning is the choice to go. Um, if you don't have data uh, and the problem is, or the problem is super simple to, to solve, then, then why bother with all this hassle? Um, did, did, did I answer yes, your question? Yes. Okay. Um, there, there's the, I don't remember the name, but uh, a paper or um, article from Google uh, a while back um, about deploying machine learning uh, to production. And they had a nice, they had a nice graphic uh, where machine learning was a little box in the middle and all the other parts you need around it just to make sure it runs properly. Mm -hmm. So we started at, uh, back then, uh, so three years ago it was, um, Two, two years ago, it was uh, two people in the team, me and another colleague, 
um, before we got the software engineer as well, where we saw, well, we know nothing about software engineering. Uh, we can develop some model here, and it looks nice on paper. We can make a report and so show it to manager and say, we would have saved so much last year, but then it's useless if, you, if we can't um, make use of it in our real-time system. And, uh, it's more painful to see what we could have had. We could have had um, there. Uh, so that's why what, what I tried in, in with the team to convey that it's nice to have preliminary results of experiments, but if we can't use them, they are uh, in some sense worthless. Um, they are more usable, or at least they should give us an indication which direction to go next. So again, reducing uncertainty or increasing information about something. But if we just find out that, yeah, this would have worked nice, but we can't use that, then it's, uh, for me, it's a bit of a waste of time. One question, David. You said you were moving from uh, yeah, data science, uh, functional, and software engineering to cross-functional teams. What were the problems when, when you started doing that and how, how did you solve that? Um, so one was language problems in terms of uh, human language and programming language. Mm -hmm. So the ones spoke um, computer science and Java and the others statistics or mm -hmm. science and mathematics and something like, I don't know, MATLAB and R and Python. Uh, and this was, um, the, uh, I, for me, the, the most uh, visual or uh, most describing aspect was uh, the software engineer asks the data scientist, did you test your model? Uh, and the data scientist says, yeah, of course I test my, I te do test my model. Then he, uh, the software engineer says, okay, where are the unit and integration tests? And the data scientist just says, what? Uh, I do hypothesis tests and like, statistical tests. Um, I don't know what you mean, and I don't know why I'm so. Of course, it's working technically, it's working on my laptop, it's fine. <laughs> um, uh, these, like, all this the deployment and DevOps thinking, that was very new for, for the data scientists. Mm -hmm. uh, and then dealing maybe, in, in especially for machine learning or um, statistics, with this uncertainty and randomness in, in the data and in the models. Um, that I would say was new for, for the software engineers. Have you ever experienced a discrepancy between experiment and actual production um, performance? Uh, yes. Me as a product manager, one of the things that I really like, which are fun for me. Um, so I'm also like, let, let's see how it performs on a live environment where we have humans actually interacting with the model and model interacting. But um, let's say you test it and it's 98% accurate. So it had 2% false positives. And then you put it into production and this number is just like flat. Yeah, then you uh, hopefully have a good way to revert back. <laughs> yes, and you're like, oh, it's fine. It's not Friday. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, but it's, it's very interesting, right? Uh, yeah, so, so um, what we would like to do there uh, would be some sort of A-B testing. Although this, I mean, uh, you would need to make sure that the fraudster in occurring or reoccurring transactions goes to the same group. Mm -hmm. uh, otherwise, one model catches the one transaction and the other one the other one, and then I don't know how that messes with the results. But yeah, that's, uh, that's the problem. Uh, you, you only see the performance when it's really performing live. Not really before that. Mm. Uh, for the machine learning scientists, the performance is actually the the the, the, statistic, like the the percentage they have when they train the model. Yeah. So that's very interesting. Yeah. That's also something that's like different languages or different perception of how how accurate something is or successful. So. Yeah. Yeah. This is um, why we also implemented uh, not only these statistical KPIs in our monitoring, but also. Uh, like more outcome metrics, so how much money did we prevent from losing uh, on our side, or um, how much uh, did the model maybe accept that we otherwise would have rejected, and so on. 
to really see a business impact, which is nice for the team to, that they know what they are doing. And again, good argumentation towards um, leadership and management side to, to say, okay, this is a approach that works well or doesn't. Essentially, uh, in the second you pass is the only option you have to prevent the flow. Uh, so the, the flow is um, you are as a user in, in the checkout, and uh, as soon as you so you insert your data and you hit pay now with let's say open invoice, uh, and this is the time where our model makes the prediction. So in real time, we um, like under a second in, uh, in the entire process, and. If the model makes a mistake there, intercepting the, the shipment is the other option, but that's not really always possible. So the model works in real time, uh, and then we have a bit of options uh, post decision or like more downstream. Yeah, but um, why is the second option necessary if the first option is available? So if you can. So what, what's the first option actually? So the customer says, I would like to pay with open invoice. Yeah. And that's when your model is triggered. Yeah. And then what you would do is tell him, you can't. You just offered it, but now you can't anymore. No, no uh, so since uh, it, it goes to us, uh, we say no. And then the, the shop says, OK, you can't pay with open invoice. Please choose another payment method. But can, can the shop override their decision to say, now I trust this man. I, I, we want well, to proceed. Like, then then that they would happen have, at all, or, they, or they would need to have their own, um, like own open invoice version. Okay. Because what we so, also so it's not possible for for the shop to come back to you and say like this go through with it no matter what. Uh, we we have concepts mm -hmm. where um, something like known customers or like. Um, trusted, trusted, trusted customers that yeah. they give us some flex and of course we not run blindly the model over the entire traffic but fine tune it to like high risk areas for example new customers I don't know different uh, certain high risk uh, basket sizes and so on okay David thank you very much for the, all the extensive <laughs> <laughs>